Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you The Unguarded Hour, starring Robert Montgomery, Lorraine Day, and Roland Young. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. On a certain day last June, a nine-inch shell from a German shore battery crashed on the deck of the United States destroyer Barton off the coast of France and fortunately failed to explode. We can thank that happy accident for the appearance tonight of our leading man, Lieutenant Commander Robert Montgomery of the United States Naval Reserve. Most of you read last week that Commander Montgomery had received the Bronze Star Medal for meritorious achievement as operations officer on an American destroyer during the invasion of Normandy on D-Day. I'm sure we're all very proud of Bob and give him our sincerest congratulations. Among the first things on Bob's schedule, now that he's released from active duty, are a picture for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and tonight's appearance on the Lux Radio Theater. The picture he is making is titled, They Were Expendable, based on the book by William L. White. And our play tonight is The Unguarded Hour, based on the screen hit of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, whose picture, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, has its world premiere in Hollywood tonight. In The Unguarded Hour, co-starring with Bob, is the ever-lovely Lorraine Day and the ever-talented ta- Roland Young. And together... They bring us one of the screen's most baffling and exciting mysteries. If at any point in tonight's play you can guess the ending, you're either a genius or a magician. And speaking of magician, I have a letter written in a round and childish hand from one of our young listeners who tells me about a party at her school. She says a magician was there. He had a box of Lux and three soiled handkerchiefs. He put the three dirty handkerchiefs in the box and shook them up then opened the box of Lux and presto, pulled out three clean handkerchiefs. <laughs> then he put his hand through the box to prove they were the same handkerchief. <laughs> well, we, we've always known that Lux worked like magic, but that's the first time we've heard of a real magician using it to mystify his audience. Now as the curtain rises, we move you all to peacetime London and the first act of The Unguarded Hour, starring Robert Montgomery as Sir Alan Dearden, Lorraine Day as Helen, and Roland Young as Bunny. On a fine spring morning a few years ago, the singularly beautiful wife of a celebrated London barrister was trotting her horse along a fashionable Mayfair bridle path. As she turned down to one of the less frequented trails, a distinguished-looking young man suddenly appeared from behind a tree and called her by name. Good morning, Lady Durden. Good morning. You don't remember me, do you? Well, I'm sure if you'll give me just a moment, I'll... No, Lady Durden, you don't know me. You've never seen me before in your life. How could you know me? I'm a very wretched character... Perhaps wicked is the better adjective. Please, what is it you want? What are you trying to tell me? That it would be a shame if Sir Alan failed to receive his appointment. It's your husband's great ambition, is it not, to become Attorney General? The laudable and logical objective for so brilliant a man. I came here to tell you there's a chance he may not be appointed. No doubt you know what you're talking about, but if you don't mind, I'd rather not listen. Lady Durden, I'm in need of 2,000 pounds, and I'd like you to get it for me. Well, my name is Frank Lewis. You see, I'm the husband of a woman so thoughtless that she saved some letters written to her by Sir Alan before he married you. My husband? Yes. My wife and I were separated at the time. She was using her maiden name, Diana Rogers. Even so, the letters provide ample basis for a most distasteful suit, if I have to bring it. Do you realize what you're saying? What makes you think I won't expose you? I have only one thing to lose, my lady, and that's my freedom. And what is freedom worth when your stony broker's eye? Two thousand pounds is not a large sum. Not when it can mean the difference between your husband's appointment and a scandal. These letters. 
How do I know you really have them? Here, a sample, my lady, selected at random. Keep it and compare the handwriting. Also note the salutation. Diana, my darling. I have others a bit more in passion. You still doubt me? Please. If you don't let go of my horse... Oh, forgive me. Think it over, my lady. I'll phone you tomorrow morning promptly at 11. Hello? You reached the decision, Lady Dodo? Yes. When can I get the letter? You're very sensible. You can get them tomorrow in Dover. Dover? Drive down. I'll meet you there in front of the post office at 2 o'clock. But how can I? I... Tomorrow, 2 o'clock. Dover in front of the post office. You're five minutes late, Lady Dodo. Well, I, I got lost. It was you who insisted we meet in Dover. Park your car down there. Then take this bag and go across the street to the bank. But I have the money. Two one-thousand-pound notes. You'll go to the bank, change the notes into five and ten, then put the money in this bag. Oh, you're mystified? Completely. Just my suspicious nature. Don't stay more than ten minutes in the bank. If you do, I'll think you're trying to mark the bills and the deal will be off. And when I leave the bank? Listen carefully. Take the Sunset View Trail to the top of the Dover Cliff. When you reach the summit, you'll see a large tree. And under the tree in a tobacco tin is a note with further instructions. I know this all sounds very penny dreadful novelish to you, but, um, well, that's the way I like it. Wait. There's something else I must know. Yes? Yeah? My husband and I are leaving for a holiday tomorrow. The Riviera. And you're worried? Haven't I reason to be? Oh, I'm a blackguard, my lady. So I doubt ex ex exceedingly if you'll believe anything I tell you. Still, for what it's worth, you have my word. You'll never see nor hear of me again. Thank you. Throw the bag over the cliff. Then retrace your steps down the trail. At the foot of the trail, walk toward the brook. Under the first lilac bush, you'll find the ladder. Over the cliff. Over the cliff. Retrace your steps down the trail. Retrace your steps. Stay here forever, Alan. Sheer laziness, darling. The curse of the Riviera. <laughs> oh, too long a swim before lunch. Oh, this food. Heaven. You do feel better, don't you, Helen? What do you mean? I feel wonderful. You really had me worried, you know. Worried? What on earth about? Oh, I don't know. Before we left London, those last couple of days especially, you looked so tired, darling. I just had a feeling something was wrong. But what possibly could have been? Alan, look. Hmm? Bunny! Well, it's Bunny. Bunny! Helen, been searching all over for you. Lunching at 2.30 in the afternoon. Shameful exhibition. Come along, Bunny, and sit down. I'm so glad to see you, Bunny. I know, darling, but don't let him see how delighted you are. I think he suspects us as it is. <laughs> Matter of fact, I didn't think you'd let us alone this long. <laughs> I'm only staying for the weekend, and don't look so happy. Always thought I was your best friend. All the way here for a weekend? Bunny, that's nonsense. It isn't nonsense, darling. It's Bunny. Always doing things like this. Bunny, I like you. You're wonderful. Helen, I'm desperately in love with you, and I'd like a cup of coffee. Sit down. How's Eloise and your brand new nephew? Yes, and what's new in London? My sister Eloise is fine. The baby's fine. Oh, I almost forgot. For you, Alan, from Lord Hathaway. I promised to deliver it in person. Hathaway? Oh, thanks, Bunny. Feels like a brief. Darling, they wouldn't. Oh, they couldn't ask you to come back. Confidentially, I plotted the whole thing. Alan called back to London. I arrived. What could be more perfect? And how did you know I was going to be called back? What? Yes. Yeah. Stanley's in the hospital. 
appendix. There's a case he was going to prosecute. Goes on trial next Wednesday. Bonnie. Oh, but I didn't know, really. Oh, just me. Another bad joke. Oh, dear. Alan, you have to leave. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I'll take the plane. I'll have only four days as it is. Alan, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, well, really, I... Stop fidgeting, Bonnie. Oh, was I? Well, there's one thing to be thankful for. The case looks interesting. Some fellow pushed his wife off the Dover Cliff. The Medford case. Let's see. Yes. Henry Medford. Papers are full of it back home. Old story. Mysterious missing witness. A woman. Medford claims she can save him. Says this woman passed by as he called a warning to his wife. Yes, he swears he, he cautioned his missus. Don't go near the edge, Annie. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Don't go near the edge, when, Annie. When did this happen, Alan? Uh, afternoon of May 14th. Day before we left. I see. Look, darling, why don't you stay on? It's been doing you so much good, and... Yes, old girl, no need to go back, you know. Please, I want to go back. I want to go back, Alan. The prosecutor for the Crown may continue. Sir Alan. Thank you, my lord. Now, Mr. Medford, a few minutes ago, you admitted that you and your wife quarreled in the Dover Hotel, just before you took a walk from which your wife never returned. Yes. We had a bit of a quarrel, but... Uh, what about? I, I can't answer that question. I tried to tell you the truth. But there are some things you have no right to ask me. She wouldn't wish me to tell you. You refuse to answer? I have to refuse. The jury will draw its own conclusion. Mr. Medford, you also testified that shortly before coming to Dover... Mrs. Medford insured her life for 1,000 pounds. At your suggestion. I haven't denied that. She had a premonition that something might happen. She wanted some provision made for her mother. Her mother? Then why is it that you are the beneficiary? Well, her mother's quite old. She didn't want her to handle the money. She knew I'd take care of it. Oh, you would take care of her. And you still maintain that your wife's sudden fall from the cliffs was simply an accident? I do, I do. I warned her against going near the edge. Uh, the woman who passed me must have heard me call to her. Ah, yes. That mysterious witness again. Suppose you describe her to the court. Uh, describe her? I, what was well, the woman? I... Tall or short? Dark or fair? Uh, what was she wearing? Uh, I can't remember. I think she was wearing a dark brown suit. Uh, yes, yes, a dark brown suit. And her age? How old was she, approximately? Well, well it's hard to tell a woman's age nowadays. I can't accept that as an answer. But I don't remember. She passed by so quickly. I, I've told you everything I can about her. Everything you can about her? Are you aware, Mr. Medford, that England has been ringing with the story of this mysterious woman? Newspapers, the wireless, the police. They've all searched for her, yet she does not come forward. Why? Why won't she make herself known? I, I don't know why. Then let me tell you. It's impossible for her to appear, Mr. Medford, because this phantom witness of yours simply does not exist. My lord, I beg the court's indulgence. Counsel for the defense? My lord, it is obvious that my client is ill. We request an adjournment until tomorrow. Any objection, Sir Alan? None at all. Court stands adjourned. <laughs> You're being greedy, Frank. Much too greedy. You got 2,000 pounds from his wife. Why aren't you satisfied? Because I'm a good businessman, Diana. You should know that by now. Alan Dearden's much too clever for anything like this. He was always smart. Of course he's smart, Diana. That's why he'll pay off. I sold his wife some letters. You'll sell him some letters. And as soon as he becomes Attorney General, we'll have a clearance sale. Sell him the balance and go out of business. Where's your sense of humor? And if he kicks up a row? Then you'll kick up a bigger one. 5,000 pounds against his career. Oh, relax, my girl. He'll know a bargain when he sees one. Telephone him tonight at his home. I'll think it over. You'll telephone him tonight at his home. Darling, come on. Dinner's almost ready. Wake up. Hmm? Oh, well. <sighs> Never done that before. Dozed off before dinner. All right, dear. Eh? Bunny just phoned. Oh? The christening's tomorrow afternoon. Eloise's baby. That's nice. And the proud parents are coming over here later in the evening. Eloise and Edward. Good. Darling, you won't forget. Five o'clock at the church. On the dot. Hey, how long have I been asleep? Just a few minutes. Bad day? Oh, sort of. 
This Medford fellow hammered away all day, but I can't seem to break him down. He persists in his story of that other woman being there. Maybe she was there, Alan. Maybe Medford is telling the truth. Alan. I just can't explain it, Alan, but I feel you may be making a terrible mistake. I'm doing my job, Helen. He murdered his wife. Oh, Alan, are you sure? You just can't send an innocent man to his death. Well, that's hardly my intention. And innocent men, dear, don't have convenient lapses of memory. They don't make contradictory statements. Darling, be fair. Well, I hope I am. No, darling, you're not. Helen, every bit of evidence points to his guilt. He can't establish any kind of an alibi. His story of that other woman on the cliff is one of the most fantastic tales I've ever heard. He couldn't even describe her. Well, maybe he didn't have time to, to get a good look at her. First he said she was wearing a brown suit. Later on it was gray with a fur collar. And it was brown again. How oh, ridiculous. Well, how many men notice what a woman wears? Oh, that's no answer. All right, close your eyes. I'll walk behind your chair. Tell me how I'm dressed. How do I look? Adorable. Thank you, but the court would call that evasive. All right, then. How's this? You're wearing a white satin gown with red and green flowers on it. Short sleeves, V-neck, belt of the same material, laced and tied in a bow in front. And now, darling, if you want to hear how beautiful you look in it, make yourself comfortable because it's going to take a long time. Oh, you'll have to admit this isn't a fair test. No average man has your power of observation. Nor a wife like you. Oh, Alan, please. Very well. Now, on what do you base your assurance of Medford's innocence? On nothing except... On nothing. Except intuition, I guess. Helen, I'm surprised. And please don't look so injured, darling. Anyway, as soon as I get the appointment, you'll have no more worries. I'll have prosecuted my last murderer. Attorney General. It means a great deal to you, doesn't it? Yes, a great deal. Would to any barrister. Once was everything I hoped for. And I found something more important on the way. And I gathered that up, too. I'm a very lucky man, Helen. Do you wonder why I love you so much? You're always so patient with me, darling. Everything I do or say sounds so... So infinitely like you. How do you think I came to worship you? Because you're so pretty? Because you win large silver cups, jumping horses, or play good bridge? No, darling. You have what's called quality. It's kindness. It's generosity. It makes all the rest of us feel just a little shoddy. Well... I guess it's time Excuse I... Excuse me, Sir Allen. Yes? Telephone for you, sir. I'll be right back, dear. Who? Who did you say this is? Alan, you've forgotten. Diana. You've really forgotten me, haven't you? It's been a long time, Diana. How are you? I could be better. I need help, Alan. I want to see you tomorrow. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I... I can't say anything more on the telephone except that it's of great importance to you, Alan. For your own sake, you'd better come. Come? Come where? My flat. Number 9 Mallet Street. I'll expect you tomorrow at 5. At 5? But I can't... What did you say? Nothing. I'll be there. Goodbye. We'll be back in Act Two of The Unguarded Hour in just a moment. Now, here are Jane and Sue and the children at the market. Hi, Janie. Another early bird, huh? I always do my shopping early when I want to stay. Hello, Jackie. How are you? Oh, oh. Hey, that's a pretty sweater you have on. Did Mommy make it? Mommy missed it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did a couple of years ago. It was Roger till he outgrew it. Oh, goodness, Alice's sweaters never last that long. They shrink so. Mm. Oh, look at that wonderful steak. Hope nobody wants it before it's my turn. Well, I think there's only one woman ahead of us now. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes, about Alice's sweaters. Well, just look at this one she's got on. It's so faded, and I've only washed it twice. Well, I've done this one of Jackie's dozens of times. Hmm, you must have a knack. Not especially. Of course, I always lux it and pin it to an outline so it keeps right to size while it's drying. Say, that's a good idea. And I just use lukewarm water and plenty of suds. All the directions are right on the Lux box. Well, I think I'll try Lux. Why don't you? Oh, say, we're next. Well, look, you go get your steak while I dash over there and get some Lux. Save my place, will you? Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of The Unguarded Hour, starring Robert Montgomery as Alan Dearden, Lorraine Day as Helen... 
and Roland Young as Bunny. It's the middle of the following afternoon. Responding to an urgent telephone call, Mr. Bunny Jeffers has hurried to the Dearden residence. Now, behind closed doors in the library, he listens with unaccustomed gravity as Helen concludes a procession of startling facts. I knew it was blackmail, of course, but what else was there to do? I see. If you had turned this scoundrel Lewis over to Alan, Alan would have had him arrested. The letters would have been made public and goodbye to Alan's appointment. Now, if, if I keep silent, an innocent man will be hanged. I know it means Alan's career, but I just can't wait any longer. I, I've got to tell the truth, Bunny. Yes, you must. If there were only some way of saving Medford without ruining my husband. Help me, Bunny. You're a lawyer. I don't know whom else to turn to. Helen, dear, of course I'll help. We still have time. Now give Uncle Bunny a nice little smile. Hmm? That's it. Perk up, old girl. I'm counting on you to see me through that dreadful prisoning this afternoon. Please, Bunny. Be careful what you say, won't you? Alan? Yes? Darling, where have you been? We waited and waited for you. Well, I went to the church, but you'd all left. They delayed the christening half an hour. Then he just had... Alan, your hand. It's nothing, really. It's all bandaged. What happened? It was a nail. I scratched it on a nail in a taxi. I want to have a look at it right now. Later, Helen, please. About the christening, I... Some rather urgent business came up. I was delayed all along the line. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> Eloise and Edward will understand, I'm sure. They'll be here tonight, you know. Oh? Who else is coming? Lord and Lady Hathaway, Bunny, of course, and the General. General? I thought he was off to Wales on some Scotland Yard affair. Look, dear, why don't you get into a hot tub? Relax before dinner. Yes, I think I will. Uh, by the way, how is poor Medford getting along? Darling, I'd rather not discuss poor Medford tonight. Do you mind? Of course not. I'll run along upstairs. I know I've been inexcusably dull tonight, Lord Hathaway, but I still don't understand why you must leave so early. Uh, doctor's orders, my boy. A uh, bed by 10.30. Uh, Eloise, Edward, uh, come along now. Oh, must you, all of you? Sure, up, Helen, I'm staying. So's the general. We'll have some cards out on there. Oh, fine. Oh, Alan. Lady Hathaway. I must congratulate you. I was in court all morning. How you made that murderous squirm. Murderer? All Medford did was to push his wife off a cliff. Henry, uh, perhaps the old girl needed murdering. Why people are so intent on hanging old Medford is beyond me. You're right, Bunny. I've told Alan as much myself. Give me one point, Bunny, in Medford's favor. Oh, go and get in the car, woman. First, there's the other woman. Surely you don't mean that phantom creature. I most assuredly do, Eloise. There may be such a woman. And there may be a Santa Claus. Why hasn't she appeared? Well, she may have gone abroad. Or she may have been in Dover under circumstances that made it impossible for her to testify. Oh, let's forget the whole miserable affair. Thank you, Lord Athway. Good night, Alan. Good night, Eloise. You sure you'll forgive me for this afternoon? Oh, of course. Oh, by the way, I saw you this afternoon on Mallet Street. Saw me? Mallet Street? Hmm, on my way to church. Well, not I, Eloise. I wasn't near Mallet Street. Strange. I could have sworn it was you. Oh, well, good night, Helen, dear. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Come on, Bunny. Come on. It's your deal. Just a second, uh... Funny, uh, what is that you just said? I simply stated, General, that this chain of evidence Alan forged around Medford is nothing more than a chain of coincidence. Well, sure you don't believe that. Curiously enough, he does. Chances are Medford is innocent as I am. At times, we all have an unguarded hour when we can't remember faces or dates or places. Too bad for Medford, his unguarded hour happens to coincide with his wife's death. Unguarded nonsense. All right, now let's assume a hypothetical crime was committed this afternoon... And that you're under suspicion. Now go ahead and prove your alibi. Where were you? What were you doing when you should have been at the christening? And remember, Eloise said she saw you on Manage Street. Eloise was mistaken. Oh, no doubt, yes. Shortly after five o'clock, some business came up and couldn't wait. I left my office. Business took me longer than I expected, and I reached home about 6.15. Oh, that's wonderful. You left your office, yes. Where did you drive to? I didn't drive. 
Drink, General? Oh, thanks, my boy, yes. Me too, old boy, me too. And answer my question. I didn't want to inconvenience Helen, so I sent Larkin home with the car. Well, what about Sergeant Byrne? Who's Sergeant Byrne? Well, one of our men. I've had him on detail to guard Alan ever since he broke up that kind of thing. I dismissed Sergeant Byrne. Oh, I know I promised you, General, but really he was getting on my nerves. A rather deliberate elimination of witnesses, eh, General? Surely you see the implications, oh boy. Now you're under suspicion. I am. Whom did I murder? And put down that drink. Suspicious characters shouldn't drink. You may not know it, Bunny, but you're becoming just a little exasperated. Good. Now, you left the stand chambers before five. Where did you go? Well, I walked over to Brock House to call on Gerald Hausman. Hausman? You trip over lawyers all day long and then you call on another. Why? Well, <laughs> nothing unusual about that, Bunny. Thanks, General. I said, why? Court's adjourned, Bunny. Sorry. You refuse to discuss it? I certainly do. The jury will draw its own conclusion. Where did I hear that before? Let's leave the Medford case out of this. Shall we? Oh, why not? About Hausman. How long were you with Hausman? I didn't see him. There was no one in his outer office. I waited for about ten minutes, then I left. And saw no one? No one. All the fishy stories, this is a prize sardine. <laughs> it's just a little strange, I must admit. Possibly, but it's true. Then what? Well, I, I walked for a bit. You walked for a bit. And all this time, we're waiting for you in the church. Me with a baby in my arms. Not a very well-mannered baby, either. I like that walking. I'm sorry, Bunny, but I wanted to reach a decision on the matter that took me to Hausman's office. And how would you like to face yourself in court someday? And not a witness? Not one. Oh, wait a minute. I bought a paper. The paper man could identify me. Paper? What paper? Daily record. Alan, I don't believe the record has a paper on the streets that early. Oh, that's right. That's right. It, it was the Chronicle. Oh, we've got him in knots, General. And I hailed a taxi, and as I got out of the church, I cut my hand on a nail. Obviously, someone saw you at church. The church was empty. I walked on home. Oh, wonderful. That cut now. You sure you didn't get into a life and death struggle with your victim? Do you believe me, or don't you? Oh, Bunny, Bunny, aren't you carrying all this a bit too far? Yes, Hilton, what is it? For the General, sir. An Inspector Granger is here to see you. What? Oh, uh, sorry, Alan. Well, I'm delighted. Maybe Bunny will give up now. We'll go on inside. Hilton, bring the inspector in here. Believe it, Grange. I simply can't believe it. They found the body an hour ago, sir. Her name is Diana Rogers. She'd been strangled. Fantastic. Manic Street, eh? Yes, sir. I came to you because of what we found. This slip of paper, sir. Memorandum. You see what's written on it? Well, just this. A.D. Strand Chamber. Yeah, but don't you see, sir, the only A.D. in Strand Chambers is, well, I'm begging your pardon, sir, Sir Alan Dearden. Did you find anything else in the flat? There was that knife on the floor that I told you about and a copy of the Evening Chronicle, 6.30 edition. The men are still searching, sir. Get back there right away. See what else you can find and call me here in an hour. Helen, you sitting here all alone while we've been in there talking. Don't apologize, Bunny. I've been writing letters. No, no, don't apologize. Just go home. Don't go home, my boy. I have to wait for the general. Well, why doesn't he go home, too? I haven't had a moment with Helen, and I'd like one. <laughs> Hush now. Here he comes. General, we're being insulted. Our host wants to get rid of us. Please don't mind Bunny. He's being simply horrible, General. Oh, but it's late, and I'm terribly embarrassed. Oh, needy. Inspector just left, and I told him to phone me here in an hour. Please stay as long as you like. Alan, I'm worried about that hand of yours. Darling, please. For one thing, the bandage is too tight. Come on, boy, let's have a look. Bunny, I could strangle you without a second's hesitation. What the devil's gotten into you tonight? Me? Nothing, old boy. Why? Alan, hold your hand still. Now, the adhesive. There we are. Oh, you see, it's nothing at all. Alan. Have a look, General. Everybody have a look. You're sure you don't want some more iodine? Oh, darling, for heaven's sake. Well, you never can tell, especially if you cut it on a nail. Is it on a nail, eh? Looks more like a cut from a knife. Nobody asked you. Well, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I think I'll run on up. Night, darling. We won't be too long. Uh, try to forgive me, Helen. This is all my fault, really. Oh, please. Good night, Bunny. And don't worry. Don't worry? What's there to worry about? Nothing at all. Always say that. Just don't worry. Alan, uh, about your hand. Uh, you were wearing gloves, weren't you? Why, well, yes. How did you know? 
Well, the cut ends abruptly at just the place where the seam of a glove would be. Now, about that glove. Uh, the dye in the glove is often poisonous. Uh, I'd like to see the one you're wearing. Oh, it was ripped. I threw it away. Oh, yes, yes, of course. What did the inspector want, General? Something nice and gooey come up? Well, I, I suppose I should tell you, but it's all such an incredible coincidence. What is? Well, there's been a murder between 5 and 6 o'clock this afternoon in Mallet Street. I knew it, General. There's your man. Murder? Who was it? A woman named Diana Rogers. Oh, uh, did you know her? No, of course not. She'd been strangled. They found a knife on the floor and a copy of the Evening Chronicle, the 6.30 edition. 6.30 edition? Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, now, see here, this is a joke. I... Alan, now, for heaven's sake, everything I've said before, that was all... Uh, this, uh, this knife that was found, it's evident that she was trying to defend herself. There was blood on the blade. The inspector believes that the murderer will be found with a cut on his right hand. Well, he does? Why the right hand? Well, because there were marks of a right hand on her throat. Also traces of blood, but no fingerprints. Whoever did it must have worn gloves. I, uh, look. Mind if I open a window? No, not at all. Fresh drink, General? No, uh, no, thanks. Yes, it is oppressive in here. Yeah, storm knocking about somewhere. Yes, I thought we were in for one. Like an oven in court today. You both of you, why don't you say what you think? Two and two make four and I'm a murderer. Alan, I, I don't know what to say. It's not uh, just a cut on your hand. There are other things, too. About my hand. Bonnie was right, of course. It wasn't a nail. When I left Brock House, I was followed. Apparently one of that counterfeit gang you mentioned. He struck at me with a knife. When I tried to shield myself, well, I was cut. Oh, that clears everything up. Uh, where did this attack take place? In one of the lanes as I cut through the embankment. Well, who saw it? No one, I'm afraid. And the man? He simply ran off. Oh, that settles that. Now, don't you think we can be running along, General? Alan, you you should have reported yes, it. I know, but I didn't want to alarm Helen. Oh, the whole thing is perfectly ridiculous. Well, almost all murders are ridiculous. I'd like to know just what you mean by that. Well, I'm sorry, Alan. Sorry, I'm tired out. I... I've been all day in a courtroom, and I don't want to be badgered with a string of questions. Where have I been? What have I done? What the devil does it matter? Alan, I, I'm talking as your friend. Go on. Now, what was the business that took you to Hausman's office? I'm sorry, but I certainly don't intend to go into that. That's probably for me. Uh, do you mind? Oh, not at all. Hello? Lawrence speaking. This is Granger, sir. Go ahead. Well, we found something bundle of letters written some years ago to the deceased by Sir Alan Dearden. Very good. I'll come to Mallet Street now. Wait for me. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> I think we can run along now, Bunny. General, I'm, I'm terribly sorry if I seemed a bit short. Oh, forget it, my boy. Good night. Come in, Bunny. In a minute. Alan, you must trust me. Will you please stop this? I remember that girl. You went with her when we were still at Cambridge. All I want to do is to help you. Help me? You've done a fine job of helping me, haven't you? You and your missing alibis. The newspaper, my cut hand. Eloise thinking she saw me in Mallet Street is like a nightmare. One thing following on top of another, all because you had to have your idiotic joke about alibis. But I tell you, I've explained everything, and I just won't listen to another word about it. Now get out. Get out. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of The Unguarded Hour will continue in a moment. But now, why, what's that you're humming, Sally? The dishwashing song. A song about washing dishes? Mm-hmm, it's an old folk song, and it goes like this. Have the water nice and clean, put the dishes gently in, dry them well and make them shine, set them on the shelf in line. Is that all? Why, yes. But it doesn't say what kind of soap to use. <laughs> I guess it was written before Lux Flakes were invented, Mr. Kennedy. So I wrote a second verse. It goes like this. 
If your hands are rough and red, Lux will leave them white instead. Thrifty Lux will also do up to twice the dishes, too. That's more like it. You know, some people still use strong soaps that make their hands rough and red because they think they're thrifty. But, Sally... I know they needn't. Tests show Lux is thrifty as well as gentle. Why, ounce for ounce, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other soaps tested. Yes, it costs surprisingly little to use Lux for dishes. And just changing from strong soaps to gentle Lux flakes takes away that ugly red look, leaves hands soft, white, and lovely. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll try to extract some personal news from Bob and from Lorraine Day and Roland Young, too. And, of course, you're invited to listen in. Now here's Act Three of The Unguarded Hour, starring Robert Montgomery as Alan Dearden, Lorraine Day as Helen, and Roland Young as Bunny. Two hours have passed, and in the flat of the murdered woman, General Lawrence and Inspector Granger weigh the evidence that has mounted overwhelmingly against Sir Alan Dearden. For the newspapers, General. Sir Alan Dearden, the man who's sending Metro to the gallows, has arrested himself for murder. We're not arresting Sir Alan, not yet, Granger. We couldn't wish for more evidence, sir. Men don't go around strangling women simply because they keep old love letters. There's not the slightest proof that this woman was blackmailing Sir Alan. Well, what do we do, sir? We wait. We wait till we've found a motive. That Metford case isn't over yet. Sir Alan will be in court in the morning, and so shall we. I received a telephone call today from the Dover Highland Bank. Sir? And I wouldn't be at all surprised if Metford's counsel introduces a new witness tomorrow morning, Lady Helen Dearden. Sir Alan's wife? Yes, and when they're through with her, I think we may have found our motive. Objection sustained. You may rephrase the question if you wish, Sir Alan. Thank you, my lord. Mr. Medford, do you or do you not remember the date on which you insured your wife for 1,000 pounds? If, if I could only think for a moment. Please do. Take all the time you wish. You'll have to hurry, Mr. Medford. Uh, I think it was the 5th of March. Yes, the, the 5th of March. And you do have a memory, Mr. Medford. The 5th of March is correct. Your witness. No questions, my lord. Step down, Mr. Mitford. My lord, I should like to call another witness at this time. Another witness? Who? She is just into the courtroom. Lady Helen Dearden. <laughs> my lord, Lady Dearden knows nothing whatever of this case. I beg to disagree. I think we shall learn that Lady Dearden knows a great deal. And at the moment, she is a witness. Bailiff, bring Lady Dearden forward and administer the oath. <laughs> Dear, why you've been called as a witness in this case, Lady Dearden? I think I have. Let me come directly to the point. Please correct me if I'm in error in the following assertion. Lady Dearden, I contend that on the afternoon of May 14th last, the date of Mrs. Medford's death, you not only were in the city of Dover, but shortly after three o'clock you made a trip to the summit of the Dover Cliffs. Is that statement correct? It is. My lord, please, I beg to interrupt. You are not in order, Sir Alan. The defense will proceed. Lady Dearden, why did you go to the summit of the Dover Cliffs? Well, the view. Everyone has heard of the wonderful view from there. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But you saw all that you wished to see in less than five minutes. May I suggest the view did not come up to your expectations? I object, my lord. Counsel for the defense is implying there may have been something strange about Lady Dearden's visit to the cliffs. The implication is absurd. Thousands of tourists visit the cliffs every year. And among those thousands were Metford and his wife. They also went to the cliffs to enjoy the view. But the Crown has persistently scoffed at such an explanation. It suggests that Medford made such a trip only for the most sinister reason. Well, if Medford, why not Lady Dearden also? The objection before the court concerns an implication. Do you wish to withdraw it, Mr. Wilson? I shall. I cease to imply, my lord. I maintain. Up to a moment ago, Sir Alan Dearden contended there were only two persons present at the scene of the tragedy, Medford and his wife. Now there are three. And the third person, so often referred to by the Crown as the mysterious witness, is Lady Helen Dearden. She is here now only because a bailiff armed with a subpoena was sent to get her. Why was that necessary? My lord, 
I am sure Lady Dearden can answer that question. That she's eager to answer any and all questions. I'll cross-examine in my own manner, if the Crown will permit. Why did you go to, uh, to Dover, Lady Dearden? To... to keep an appointment. With whom? Why must I answer all these questions? What does it matter whom I went to see? Christians are perfectly proper, Lady Dearden. Well, let me seek an answer another way. Lady Dearden, while in Dover, you went to the Dover Highland Bank. You changed two £1,000 notes into five and ten-pound notes. Did you not? Please, my lady. Yes or no? Yes. You put the money in a small black bag. That bag was found open and empty near the body of Mrs. Medford at the foot of the cliff. The bag has been identified by the bank clerk who served you. The same bank clerk, mindful that people don't go around changing thousand-pound notes every day, had the good sense to jot down the license number of your car. Now, Lady Dearden, after leaving the bank, did you not drive to the cliffs and then walk up the trail to the summit? Yes, sir. I did. And reaching the summit, you did what with the bag of money? I threw it over. You threw two thousand pounds over the cliff? Why? There was a man waiting for it at the bottom. I gave him the money for some letters. Some letters my, my husband had written long ago to this man's wife. That was all before Sir Alan and I were married. Did your husband know of this, Lady Dear? No. I knew what he would have done, and I loved him too much to let him sacrifice his career. No, Lady Dearden. Did you pass anyone on the trail as you went toward the summit? No, no one. And on the way down from the summit? Yes. Well, at first, I, I heard voices. A man calling to a woman. I continued on my way down. Around the bend, I passed the man. He was picking some wildflowers. And you saw him? Yes. What did he say to the woman? I, I, I don't recall the exact words, but he was warning her. Warning her to keep away from the edge of the cliff. Did the woman answer? She said she was all right or something like that. Hmm. Did they seem happy? What was the tone of their conversation? Normal, friendly. Hmm. And this man, did he warn the woman before or after he saw you? Before. You're certain? Yes. Would you recognize this man if you saw him? I think so. Mr. Metford, step forward, please. Is that the man? Yes. Thank you, Lady Deirdre. My lord, the defense rests. My lord, I should like to explain Lady Dearden's attitude in this case. She has never told me her reasons for thinking so, but she's always maintained that Medford was innocent. I'm certain she would have come forward voluntarily and prevented any miscarriage of justice. Sir Alan, the defense rested. Any questions? No questions, my lord. Do not leave the stand, Lady Dearden. You testified to paying 2,000 pounds to a man in exchange for some letters. Under the law, the man who received that money is guilty of extortion. The court asks that you give his name. I, I can't remember his name. Perhaps if I have the time... The letters in question were received by his wife. Surely you remember her name? Yes. Her name is Diana Rogers. Diana Rogers? Lady Dearden, have you seen the morning newspaper? No, my lord. Diana Rogers was murdered yesterday in her flat in Mallet Street. Murdered? Alan! <laughs> General, what have you done with them? They asked me for a few minutes alone. Uh, it's the least I could do for them. Uh, They're in that room there. You've arrested Alan? Well, what else could I do? He had the evidence last night. He had the motive ten minutes ago. Uh, wait a moment. They're coming out. Bunny, I'm glad you're here. Alan, I... Would you mind taking Helen home? Goodbye, dear. Alan. Oh, my darling. Come along, old girl. Come along. I'd like to make a statement, General. Please believe me, Alan. I'll do anything I possibly can to help you. I killed Diana Rogers. Self-defense, of course. Uh, she had a knife. Yes. I hadn't seen her in years. Two days ago, she telephoned and insisted on seeing me. I had an idea what she wanted. Poor Helen. She thought she had bought all the letters. Well, she hadn't. I went to Mallet Street. As I reached her door, I heard someone down the hall. I wanted to avoid being seen. I tried the door, and it wasn't locked, and I went in room was dark. As I turned to shut the door, she rushed at me. She sounded drunk. She kept shouting, so you've come back, have you? I could see she had a knife in her hand. She'd mistaken me for someone else. She lunged at me with the knife. That's how I got that cut. 
Then she raised the knife again. I had to defend myself. I grabbed her by the throat. Well, when she stopped struggling, she fell to the floor. She's dead. I assume so. I didn't wait to see. And you uh, still believe she had mistaken you for another man? I'm certain of it. He must have been there shortly before I arrived. Undoubtedly, they had quarreled. You realize, Alan, that all this depends entirely on that other man? Yes. Unless he appears and admits having quarreled with her, I'm afraid your story won't stand up. I'm sure he'll come forward, General. I have an idea it might have been her husband. I hope so. We have a few questions to ask that same gentleman about a trip to Dover and 2,000 pounds. Uh, Granger. Uh, sir? I uh, find the name of Diana Rogers' husband. Uh, got it last night, sir, from the neighbors. It's Frank Lewis. We've got him on file. Good. Give me his photograph. Yes, sir. I'll have Helen identify his photograph before we pick him up. Meanwhile, Alan... Uh... Yes, yes, I know. I, I have to be formally charged. I'm afraid so. Oh, how's Medford? A very happy man, Alan. A free man. Oh, uh, I saw that he got your letter. Thank you, General. Well... Let's get down to Bow Street. It was too important to wait, Helen. That's why I asked you to come back down here. May I see, Alan? Well, of course. But I want you to look at this first. Now, this is a photograph of a man named Frank Lewis. Lewis. That's the name. Frank Lewis. He was the man I gave the money to. Yes, he was arrested six years ago for fraud. Now, uh, look at the picture, Helen. Is this the only one you have of him? Yes. Now, uh, that's the man, all right, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, that's Lewis. No, no, this isn't the man. Helen, are you certain? This picture doesn't resemble Lewis in any detail. Well, that's very odd, Helen. This man was Diana Rogers' husband. Well, maybe the man she was working with only posed as her husband. Yeah, possibly. Stranger, come here. In view of uh, Lady Dearden's statement, there's no point in trying to find Frank Lewis. Yes, sir. Oh, I have several reporters outside, General. Is there anything we can tell them? Mm, yes, I suppose so. Uh, tell them that Lady Dearden was unable to recognize the husband of Diana Rogers as the blackmailer. Come in, please, Mr. Lewis. You're not shocked to see me, Lady Dearden? No, I counted on hearing from you. I've been reading the newspapers. Very decent of you not to identify me as the uh, blackmailer. It wasn't the truth, you know. No, but you had a very good reason for not identifying me, didn't you? Since the police no longer want me for extortion, I'm now free to help Sir Ellen. Yes. You were the man who quarreled with Diana Rogers, weren't you? She was a very unsavory character, milady. Ah, you don't know how much your word can mean to us now. Milady, I never relish seeing an innocent man punished. Then you'll come with me and... And make a statement at Scotland Yard? Why, well, of course. That's why I'm here. Oh, uh, before we go... Uh, yes? I hope to travel extensively after Sir Alan has been released, and um, traveling is so costly. How much this time? Uh, Ten thousand pounds. I had my heart set on a ranch in Canada. You'll get it. It may take me a day or two. You trust me? I have a very good reason to trust you, milady. You need me even more than I need you. Well, shall we visit the Yard? So we picked up Bunny on the way and came right down here, General. Uh-huh, yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Lewis. General? Uh, the man uh. who blackmailed Lady Dearden, the man who used your name and posed as Miss Rogers' husband, do you uh, have an idea who he is? The way Lady Dearden described him, I assume he was a chap my wife became involved with after we'd separated. Chap name of um, Adams or Abbott. We're well, very grateful to you, Mr. Lewis, coming forward as you did. Oh, about Mr. Lewis's statement, General? Uh, Granger's having it typed out now. I sent for Alan, Helen. I thought he'd like to be here. Come in. The prisoner, General. The darling. Alan. Alan, meet Mr. Lewis, Miss Rogers' husband. Well, it appears I can help you out of this mess, Sir Alan. Yes, so the inspector told me. Uh, Mr. Lewis's statement, General. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Um, I'll read this back to you, Mr. Lewis. On the afternoon in question, I called on my estranged wife to discuss a divorce. She was drinking and abusive. There was a violent quarrel. She ordered me out of her flat. As I opened the door, she grabbed a knife and screamed, If you ever come back here, I'll kill you. I make this statement voluntarily in the interests of justice. Signed, Frank Lewis. Now, if you'll uh, sign this, please. Here's a pen. 
Oh, you're not removing your glove? Oh, no need of that, old man. Just my signature, you know. Well, Alan, <laughs> with this statement, your plea of self-defense is watertight. No jury in the land would convict you. And now if you're done with me for the day, I'll say au revoir. I'm so grateful, Mr. Lewis. Not at all, my lady. I think the least I can do is to shake your hand, Mr. Lewis. Oh, <coughs> It's quite all right. Sorry, did I hurt your hand? Oh, no, not at all. I'm sure I hurt your hand. Let me have a look at it. Aren't you being a little silly? Money, here. What the, what the devil are you doing, Alan? Money, the glove. Take your hand off me. Hold him, Take it. Hold him, Alan. I'm getting it. Hang on to him, Bunny. Do you Gentlemen, look. intend explaining this or... Look at, look at his hand. I cut my hand. What about it? You killed Diana Rogers, didn't you? I what? Alan, you... You confess to uh, killing her yourself. I'm afraid I told you rather a deliberate lie, General. We were sure, Helen and I, that Lewis had done it. The problem was finding him. We figured it out when you left us alone yesterday. I wasn't near Mallet Street that day. Oh, incidentally, Lewis is also the man who took the money from Helen. Helen? You'll understand now why I didn't identify the photograph, General. If I had, it would have been in the papers. Lewis would know we were looking for him, and we might never have found him. Oh, we'd have found him all right. And what would you have found, General? Only a blackmailer, not a murderer. The evidence still remained all against me as far as Diana Rogers' death was concerned. My confession was in the papers. Lewis read it. His troubles were over, and he'd be free to earn another little sum by bolstering my plea of self-defense. What was his price this time, Doll? Ten thousand pounds. I still think I quote a very modest figure. Yes, when I read your confession, I was a trifle puzzled. Oh, greatly relieved, though. I assumed I hadn't killed her, that you must have come after I left and finished the job. Funny. His hand. Let's go a moment. And Alan, your right hand, please. Why, it's remarkable. Two cuts, almost identical. Almost. Except yours is shorter, Alan. Not nearly as vertical, either. Yes. Yes. That thin streak of blood on Diana Rogers' throat. It, it was vertical. It couldn't have been made by your hand, Alan. And Lewis got away, General. If I hadn't confessed... Would you still swear it couldn't have been made by my hand? No, I don't think you would. Too much other evidence against me. Why, it's, it's frightening. Yes, General, frightening. Uh, uh, would you care to make a second statement, Mr. Lewis? Oh, why not? Of course, you did come at me with a knife. I did what I could to defend myself. Uh, Granger, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Lewis has a statement to make. Too bad I can't retain you as counsel, dear Dan. You think fast and take chances. Yes, I should say you do take chances, Alan. You're not... Now, what about that weird story you told us at your house? Yes, Houseman's Office, the Evening Chronicle. I'm getting knifed by that fellow from the counterfeit ring. Everything I told you at my house was the truth. And the more I talked, the more difficult I knew it would be to prove a single statement. That didn't matter until Granger arrived with word of the murder. Then I knew that every sentence I spoke, and all of it the truth, led me a step closer to the gallows. Alan, I wish you'd get out of here. Really, you're making me terribly nervous. Nothing else I can do for you, General. Nothing. Oh, in case we should want you, uh, where will you be? The Riviera, General. For about the next month, I should say. Good. Send me the bill. Uh, I was just thinking. You got into all this mess because you told the truth, and you get out of it because you tell a lie. That's right, Alan. I had no idea you could lie so beautifully. Well, if I may say so, Lady Dearden, you do very well yourself. <laughs> Our stars return in a moment to take their curtain calls. You know the old saying that misfortunes often come in threes? Well, sometimes three is a lucky number. It would be good luck, wouldn't it, if you could keep all your pretty under things new looking three times as long? Well, you can do just that by giving them gentle lux care. It seems surprising that the way you wash things can make such a difference, but it does. Very careful tests by the famous United States Testing Company, Incorporated, proved how very much easier Lux flakes are on colors and fabrics. A great many slips were washed repeatedly by wash day methods, handled roughly, using strong soap and hot water. Then, exactly the same kinds of slips were washed the Lux way. You should see how quickly the slips faded the wash day way, and how seams pulled, shoulder straps frayed. The Lux garments kept their color looked lovely and nice as new even after three times as many washings. So every time you use those rich, gentle Lux suds for under things and other nice things too, you're being very thrifty. 
Now, back to Mr. DeMille and our stars. And now we are happy to welcome Bob Montgomery to our footlights after his four years in the service. And with him, Lorraine Day and Roland Young share their curtain call. You gave an excellent performance, all of you. Thank you, C.B. It's good to be back with all of you, C.B. Bob, they, they tell me it's pretty hard to get you to talk about yourself or your experiences in the service. Won't you change that rule on Lux tonight? What was the most exciting thing that happened to you? Well, the most vivid thing I remember didn't happen to me. It happened to a town. To a town? Yes. A little French village called port en bessin The boys used to call it port en bessin <laughs> A town you visited on shore leave? Well, I visited it in a way, but not on shore leave. I saw it first at dawn on D-Day from the deck of a destroyer. Peaceful and homelike, picturesque. But we knew that surrounding it were Nazi batteries and military targets. We had to shell it. I thought at the time the French who lived there would never forgive us. We shelled that village for two days until the swastika came down and the French tricolor took its place. Then did you go ashore? No, but that day in scores of little fishing boats, the people sailed out to us, singing, calling their thanks, <laughs> throwing flowers on the deck. They were the people you thought would never forgive you. I guess they knew your shells were bringing freedom with them, Bob. Well, I know for me that town is a sort of a symbol of this whole war in which people are glad to face suffering and sacrifice and danger so long as they know these things can bring them freedom. And when I see people like that, I realize what a privilege it is for Americans here at home to be able to buy war bonds, not just buy them, load up on them. Yes, I can imagine that you appreciate the reason for this war bond drive better than most of us. Well, from what I've seen of the men who are doing the fighting in this war, I know they don't question what we do back home. They just take it for granted that we're no stingier with our dollars than they are with their lives. That's what I mean when I say it's not just an opportunity, it's a privilege to buy those war bonds that will help give them the stuff to fight with and bring them home a little sooner. And you, you've given us something to think about, Bob. By the way, you know, uh, Lorraine is wearing a uniform these days. Lorraine? Hey, in our next uh, picture for Metro Goldwyn Mayor, she's a whack. <laughs> What's the picture called? Well, it's not definite, but I think they're going to call it Thank You, Ma'am. Oh, well, I look forward to seeing it, Lorraine. Right now, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have for Lux next Monday night, C.B. Well, you've probably seen the international RKO picture, Casanova Brown. I love it. You. <laughs> well, next Monday night, we're bringing it to this stage with Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, and Joan Bennett. You'll find Gary in more funny predicaments than a prune has wrinkles. We'll be listening. Good night, Phoebe. Good, Good night, Phoebe. Good night. Good night. The unguarded hour was a very pleasant 60 minutes. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gary Cooper, Joan Bennett, and Thomas Mitchell in Casanova Brown. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Roland Young will soon appear in Ten Little Indians from the book And Then There Were None. Heard in tonight's play were Charles Seal, Norman Field, Claire Verdera, Alec Harford, Gloria Gordon, Eric Snowden, Raymond Lawrence, Boyd Irwin, Jacqueline DeWitt, Fred Warlock, and Leslie Danielson. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of The Unguarded Hour, starring Robert Montgomery, Lorraine Day, and Roland Young, has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap used by smart housewives everywhere. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Casanova Brown with Gary Cooper, Joan Bennett, and Thomas Mitchell. Fry. Bran for cake and pie. Fry. Every time you fry. Fry. It's the shortening buy. Yes, ma'am. New spry cakes are lighter, better tasting. Spry pastry is so tender and flaky. Fry fried foods are crispier, so digestible.